Our speaker today is Dr. William Bridgman, and his topic is Cosmos in, our, in Your Pocket. A surprising amount of science we understand today started out as solutions to problems in astronomy. His talk will describe some of the connections between astronomy and technologies we use today and their history. Uh, Dr. Bridgman received his PhD in uh, physics and astronomy from Clemson, studying nuclear and high energy astrophysics. After completing his doctorate, he worked as an instrument specialist at the uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. He currently works as a media, uh, as a contractor doing database scientific visualization for NASA <coughs> media and public outreach. Over the years, he became involved in refuting pseudoscientific claims in astronomy, particularly young Earth creationism and more recently, electric universe claims. He operates a website blog dealing with creationism and astronomy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. William Bridgman. Well, this talk has gone through a, a lot of incarnations. I started giving it, um, gosh, maybe four or five years ago. And it has kind of a, but some of the aspects of it go back to when I was in grad school in, in terms of how it started. Let me point out, uh, I am a, a, a contractor, and while I work at a NASA center, I do not in any way speak for the, for the institution. So I need to put that disclaimer in there. But uh, anyway, this, this is something that, uh, like I said, I, I started kind of in grad school where I started f finding these interesting connections between fundamental science and cosmology. So, we'll start out with kind of the general question that a lot of people like to ask. They say, why study astronomy? And a lot of people will say, oh, well, you, the, 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 the popular answer is, well, you know, it gives us a sense of our origins. It gives us a sense of our, our, our place in the universe. It gives us a sense of perspective, how small we are compared to the, the rest of the cosmos. And very often, the, the, the rationale ha is, has a lot of spir almost spiritual meaning. Um, but there's also a practical side of astronomy. I mean, virtually everyone is familiar with how astronomy contributed to early days of navigation in terms of providing fixed points in the sky, or at least reasonably fixed points in the sky, if you count the daily motion, um, for, for doing navigation and stuff like that. But it goes beyond that, surprisingly enough. Astronomy often provides very useful extremes of temperature, pressure, and density useful for testing theories in a very fundamental way. Sometimes we can't make these, these conditions in a laboratory. And when we do these types of tests, we find out it provides a check on our interpretation of what's going on out there. If we see something out in the distant cosmos and say, oh, I think that could be because of this process going on in an atom, and we can reproduce that phenomenon in a laboratory, it helps reinforce our interpretation of what's happening out in the distant cosmos. And as a result, it sometimes provides a little bit of a head start in studying physical processes which may one day be important in technologies. I'll start out with, a, with the, the classic story about this where it really started the, uh, our, modern, our modern science and, and technology that um, a gentleman named Isaac Newton allegedly, according to, to, to legend, got bumped on the head to think of it. In 1687, he published his, his uh, big work, the Principia Mathematica, in which he proposed what he called the theory of universal gravitation. Now, this was a pretty bold thing for a guy to, to call something universal gravitation, someone sitting on a little planet in the middle of a solar system, which actually around that time they were getting a rough idea of how big it was. But he proposed that the force of gravity between two objects the force F is equal to the mass of the uh, one object times the mass of the other object divided by the distance between them. So if something was twice as far away, it would have one-fourth the force as if it was at some fixed distance. And if it was three times far away, it would have one-ninth the force. So the force would drop off with distance. And he threw in an extra little constant that they, uh, they called big G because he needed to make the, the, the math work out right. This was an arbitrary constant that made the units work. Well. There was a lot of stuff that Newton had to leverage this idea. There was a number of things that were known at the time. Around 1590, we had determined that falling objects were mass independent, that you could drop, unfortunately I don't have anything to drop conveniently here, two objects of different mass, 
let them go at the same time, they would fall and, and hit simultaneously. Uh, a, a thing which was uh, parodied a, a bit in, if anyone's ever seen the movie, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. <laughs> you know, they, they kind of parody, parody the, these, these types of things. Um, around the 16, in, the, in the early 1600s, Johannes Kepler developed his three laws of planetary motion, where he had discovered, studying the positions of Mars in particular, that the planets moved in ellipses and that they swept out equal areas in equal times and there were fixed relationships between the distances these objects were from the sun and the amount of time it took for them to go around the sun. Um, a little bit later, a fellow named Ishmael Balu, and I'm, I'm sorry I, I, my pronunciation on, on a lot of these names is going to be her, her, horrendous, but if someone can correct me, please let me know. Um, Ishmael Balu realized that an inverse square force law, that a central force pulling at an object would make that, uh, uh, the other object move in an ellipse around it. And around 1672, Dominic Cassini had obtained the first estimate of the astronomical unit, the distance of the Earth from the Sun. So this was sort of a fundamental distance that, was, that would be used in a, a lot of astronomy. Uh, the, the nice thing was we could skip for the, the solar system, we could scale everything with this number. And the trick was finding an accurate value for that number to turn these relative distances into absolute distances. And around 1678, uh, Robert Hooke, who uh, was a bit of a Newton a contemporary and a competitor, and there's a, lo a load of stories about that that I won't go into, uh, concludes that gravity is an inverse square law. So a lot of the pieces were there. The mass independence of the force law comes from the product of the masses, and the 1 over r squared, well, you know, he had the ellipses and stuff like that. So he had a, had a pretty good idea. He had a lot of the pieces. It took Newton to, to bring those pieces together. Sometimes we, we, we look at a lot of the history of this stuff and we think that, bam, it was like hit with this magical insight of what it had to be. And he had a lot of help. You know, as Newton said, he, he um, got to where he saw further than most by standing on the shoulders of giants, and these are some of the giants whose shoulders he stood on. But what did Newton not know? Well, as you do in science, you propose an idea like this, and he's, he's, Newton's done it right. He's, he's put it out there. He's put an equation that people can use the mathematical techniques they're developing to extend that idea and find out what else this theory predicts.